Well, Michael, thanks for joining us on Test of Time. Um, talk about the Old Trafford Test match uh, in 2005, one that you got a big hundred in the in the first Test match, but it was four days after Edge Baston, um, and what a roller coaster that was of emotion, of energy that w- was put in. Um, and we come to we come to Old Trafford. We picked the same side. Um, there was a lot of talk in the in the build up that um, I think it was. Um, was it Gilchrist separated um, Ponton and Warren? I didn't hear that, I must admit, in the Edge Baston dressing room, but there were murmurs that things weren't going well with, um, with the Australians in between the two games. But what's your recollection going into the toss? Because something happened at the toss with you, I know you spoke about, that probably changed your outlook on what the test match and the series going forward. Going back then, I, I, I was um, obviously like yourself, we were, we were we were back in the series. So Edge Baston, even though I'd not done well uh, really with the bat, uh, just to get the win um, and, and to beat the Australian side once, it gave me a boost as a captain. You know, to know that we're in the series, three to go. Uh, Edge Baston, Sunday morning, it was looking like it was going to be 2 nil for, for a quite a long period. And then all of a sudden, uh, you managed to get one straight, Steve. Got one straight, um, yeah. It was always, always a surprise. Uh, but great, managed to get the glove of Kasmovic. And, you know, as a captain, that, that gave, um, you know, people always look at the team and you win. But as a captain, you get such a, a huge buzz of, of, of confidence when your team win a game, particularly a close game. Uh, so I arrived at Old Trafford. I, I'll be honest, I was playing dreadfully. <laughs> I was all over the place. I didn't quite have my balance. Um, you know, and that's the number one thing that I always used to feel uh, when I wasn't playing well. If I felt balanced at the crease and I could play forward or back, uh, with confidence, I always felt I could play against anyone. And, and for those first two test matches, I, I just felt all over the place. My head was falling over. Um, you know, my hands on the on the handle just didn't feel right. Uh, couldn't feel like I was getting back into the ball. Uh, I was done for pace by Brett Lee in the second innings at Edge Baston. So, um, not a great deal was going my way. But the series was alive, and I, re- I remember the, the practice days. And Duncan Fletcher, the coach, would would be talking to me privately away from all the players and. and you know, you know, my message was always to the players, come on, just enjoy it. You know, this is a, a great stage, great um, moment of our lives. Just get out there and enjoy it. And, and privately, I was thinking, I'm not enjoying it at all because I'm playing awfully. Um, and Flesh would always say, Flesh, just try, try and enjoy batting. You know, you're actually starting to play OK. And I found something in the nets that I, I you know, triggered my balance to be uh, back where I wanted it. But it was, it was that toss of the coin, a young five-year-old uh, called uh, Connor Shaw. And I always remember walking down the, the steps of uh, the, the the Old Trafford Pavilion, went onto the outfield, and there's always loads around. You know that Steve, there's there's, there's press there, there's uh, people helping out with the ECB of the operational side of the day, players, staff, you name it. There's loads of people on the ground, and then uh, I can't remember who the the lady was who was running our operations, but she she took me over to the to the mascot Connor. And he was five years old. He's got wires all over him. He's had three heart operations, and he was smiling. And I wasn't smiling with my blazer and my hat on. And I remember him, he, he looked at me, he went, why aren't you smiling? And I said, very good question. I said, I'm going to try and smile today. I said, you're absolutely right. I should be smiling. He said, you should be enjoying the game. And I went, you know what? I, I'm glad you've said that because you're absolutely right. And I, could, I remember looking at this five-year-old thing and, you know, how am I concerned about not getting runs or not enjoying playing cricket when this little kid's gone through so much? So, uh it just kind of relaxed me. Uh, managed to win the good toss. Uh, it was a beautiful day. Sun was shining. The pitch at Old Trafford. It's always a good one. Um, it, it swings a little bit, but not a lot. And you know that the bounce is going to be true. So it suited my style of play. Uh, and I just got into rhythm early. I was out there quite. I think Strassi got hit on the head. I think quite quite early in the in the game, and there was a little bit of blood coming down his face. Um, I think when I was taking guard, actually, um, there was a bit of claret on the floor, which is, which is not always a great sight as a, as a batter. But um, I, I did. Old Trafford has always been a venue that I fancied getting runs because of the, the hard nature of the pitch. And I, I like to hang back, as you know, wait on the back foot and then dip into the, the full length deliveries. So it suited my style of play. And um, the Aussies were on the attack. They always had this ego approach with about five slips and two gullies so there was loads of gaps everywhere so if you just get a bit of bat on it you're, you're always off and running against Australia managed to get a few through a few gaps and um, you know I just found rhythm I found rhythm very very quickly but I, I do think a lot of it's in the mind you know I think playing at the highest level is 
pretty much a, a game where when you get to the highest level, you've obviously got talent, you've got ability, but it's then can you switch your mind into being in the right place? And little five-year-old Connor Shaw just put me in a in a state where I decided just to go out, watch the ball and see where it would take me. And Strauss, you mentioned Strauss gets out early. And that you said balance you found and you know the, the confidence that you yeah you got off Connor walking out there. How was it how was important was it when you walk out and a guy like Triscothic's at the other end who takes a lot of pressure off batsmen, but also somebody that you batted with for a long time, got a good relationship with, and you managed to you know overcome a little bit of luck. You know, McGrath off a no ball, Gilchrist dropped he dropped Straussy first, then he dropped uh, he drops Trez first, then he dropped yourself. And then it, you must have thought, well, this is my day. This is my day. You batted a long time with Trez and somebody you feel comfortable batting with. Yeah. Um, you know, many things felt right um, from, you know, the pitch. You know, I think when you take your guard and you look down at a pitch, there are days when you take your guard and think, oh, no, I don't fancy this at all. Uh, for whatever, there's the, always that little shine at Old Trafford on days one and two. And uh, I, I like to see that as a batter. I, I didn't think it was going to be seeming too much. A uh, little bit of swing, but I, I could always fancy coping with that. Um, true bounce was a key key for me. But I felt the bounce was going to be true. Uh, I always fancied my chances. But having Trez there, he's very chilled. I, I'm very relaxed when I'm out in the middle. Um, but it's amazing when you, when you can just go out and enjoy playing rather than think about the consequences or worry about, you know, the, the, the aspects of failing again. Um, it it kind of cleared me, Connor's little conversation cleared me of that negative thought that, you know, every player has, you know, that, that horrible thought of getting naught or five or ten or, you know, playing a bad shot. It kind of relieved me of all that kind of thought process and I decided just to play, you know, just react and see. And of course, you know, I got fortunate with McGrath and the no ball, uh, Gilly dropping me. Um, but I kind of look back at all my test hundreds and, and I've always had an element of luck. You know, you, you do need an element of luck to get to get runs and, uh, you know, to get them on, on that given day when the series was alive and we're trying to set up the game. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer that some things are meant to be in that day. Uh, you know, it's a venue, as I said, I made my, my county debut there against Wazi Makram and Phil DeFraces back in, I think it was 1994. Uh, and, and pretty much from playing in the second 11 in England under 19s, I'd always gone to Old Trafford and done well. It's always been a venue where I've had success. And I guess, you know, you'll be the same as a bowler when you're out of nick or you're not in the, the runs or not in the wickets. It's always a nice, nice to arrive back in the dressing room where you've had previous successes. And I got my first test match centre there against Pakistan. And I just, I've, I've always felt comfortable uh, practising at Old Trafford, playing at Old Trafford, and I'd always fancied my chances. So, uh, yeah, kind of re relaxed me in, in terms of my mindset. But uh, I've always fancied it at Old Trafford. There's something about that ground that I always uh, kind of arrived. I like the food, those Eccles cakes as well. They're nice. <laughs> have, have a few of those Eccles cakes. You always get good grub. We stay in a nice hotel. Uh, I, I've always fancied it at Old Trafford. In, yeah, I, I can totally agree about the Eccles cakes. It's beautiful. It's the food <laughs> at Old Trafford. I think I've had a few since then as well. But um, we, we talk about from Edgebaston. Australia had to bring McGrath back. So they brought McGrath back. Gillespie was under a little bit of pressure. Was that always in the mindset of going after Dizzy? Because you know, Dizzy being a fantastic bowler for Australia, he, we caught him a little bit in the one days and you seem to tuck in a little bit more than anybody else in the uh, in that first year. Yeah, well, I, I reckon Peterson did for, for Gillespie at uh, Bristol in the one yeah. day series, you know, when he was launching him pretty much back into the town centre. It was around that time that you guys in the dressing room kept on coming to me as a skipper saying, make sure he's playing in the ashes. And I was like, don't worry, he's his. He'll be in the 11. Don't, don't, don't worry yourselves with that uh, thought process. But, um, you know, McGraw, let's be honest, he wasn't fit. Hmm. You know, and that was a, I, I thought, felt it was a confident boost for us that Australia were willing to go into a game with a, a bowler that wasn't fit. He bowled okay in his first ball. He didn't have the, the fortune, but seeing him in the outfield hobbling around, um, I thought that was a, a, a great um, kind of pick pickers up, you know, in terms of a, a confidence boost for our team because, you know, I, I think in the past Australia wouldn't have played him, but I think Australia for, for the first time in many, many years feared as they realised that we had a team that could really compete with them. Um, so that was a, a big confidence boost. And Gillespie, um, he didn't swing it. You yeah. know, he wasn't swinging it, you know, back in his heyday, he was hooping it around you know, past the outside edge of right-handers. He just couldn't get the ball to move. And 
it was quick enough still. I still thought he was quick through the air, but those full of length deliveries, you could hit through the line and anything slightly short. Um, you know, my, my mechanism was always to, you know, try and pull him over mid wicket. Um, and it just seemed to be a nice big gap over mid wicket for me to try and aim for. Um, but, you know, it's just a, a pure wicket bounce. Again, is the key. You, you get that true nature of the bounce and, you know, Dizzy, you could tell, you know, he's a human being. I could tell on day one that he wasn't as confident that I played against him in the past in two, 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 three, when he was flying. Uh, he, he just had this aura of confidence. Uh, yeah, and you can spot it, you know, you know, out in the middle when you're playing against someone that's not quite at the confident level. Um, you know, and I felt it on day one. I just felt there was an opportunity to kind of attack him and put him under pressure. I had a huge amount of respect for him and he's a brilliant bowler. But, you know, I think we all felt that there was an opportunity for us to just to, so almost, we, we didn't take him out of the equation, but I, I felt we all dealt with him in a, in a fashion that uh, left Ricky Pont in, you know, asking himself a few questions of, of when he could bowl certain bowlers. So that was important from a team collective that we attacked the right right bowlers at the right time. Clearly, to attack McGrath and Gillespie, uh, and McGrath and Warren all the time, it's it's high, high risk. But I think we we attacked the right bowlers at the right time. That includes Shane Warren. You know, I thought Edgebast and Trescothic and Strauss in that first spell on that first day was was very important for the whole series where they took um, Shane Warren downtown. You know, they hit him over the top and then, and I think Freddie did and, and, and Kevin Peterson. Uh, so I thought we, we chose the right moments to attack the right bowlers and day one at Old Trafford. Uh, it, it was, unfortunately for Gillespie, his, his moment to, to, to cop a bit of a battering from us. It was in end of day one, end of day one, um, or something else that happened in day one. It was a great, a great version. You were in the middle. Warren gets his 600 test match wicket. And, you know, phenomenal achievement by one of the old time grits. Um, he gets 600 against Trez and he's 700 against, against Strout. There's a lot of talk about, you know, bad feeling between, you know, England and Australia. But I thought the version that Warren got during that, during that time was first class. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the bad feeling, um, you know, we know from being in, in, inside the camp uh, is pretty much a lot of, uh, I, I guess, supporters talk, media talk. Of course, yeah. it's it's competitive and we're desperate to win. But I think of all the teams that you play against, I think the ultimate respect is England and Australia. And that's not disrespecting uh, other cricketing nations. But you know you're a part of something special when you play against Australia. And I think, you know, I'd hope that they feel exactly the same about playing us that, you know, when you look at the history of sport and cricket, um, there's only a small few that have actually participated in Ashes series. And you feel like you're joining a club. So when Warren got his 600, uh, as much as the, the English crowd gave him plenty and, uh, you know, he caught quite a bit of stick, I think it was out of respect. And I think it was out of the respect that they knew that if they uh, could in any way, shape or form, and it, it was very rarely possible, just put him off his game or distract him somewhat. Uh, the crowd tried to do that, but it was it, it was purely because of the respect. Uh, you know, he's, in my opinion, the greatest ever. I mean, if I was picking a, a World eleven, I'd start at number eight, Shane Warne, and then pick the side uh, around Shane Warne. So, um, you know, I look back again, I'm sure you do, and you, you realise you've played with, you know, in 50 years' time, 100 years' time, when someone else is talking about cricket, I, I still think Shane Warne will be a, a prominent conversation about, um, you know, cricket is in the future, talking about the past and... When you know that, it's like Bradman, you know, yeah. people talk about Bradman, WG Grace. It's like Shane Warne in 100 years' time will still be talked about. So it's uh, special to be even having a conversation, thinking about I was out there in the middle when he got his 600. You were there when he got his 700s against Straussy. Um, yeah, a real legend of the game. In end of day one, England are 341 for five. Belly's 59, not out. Um, just a, a little thing on, on Ian Bell, because there was a lot of talk at the, at the start of the series. Graham Thorpe, 100 test matches. You, know, you were obviously heavy in that decision. Kevin Peterson, who just took the world by storm in ODI cricket. And Ian Bell, a little bit like Ollie Pope when it comes to the England side. You've got to try and find a place for him because this is our future. Yeah, I mean, it's always risky picking a 12-year-old. <laughs> 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 but he showed a lot of promise. I mean, um, you know, it's been, you knew at the time, Steve, but it, it, it was very important for me as a captain to go into the series with a new set of players. It was so important that I felt that we needed a, a fresh set of minds. Um, Graham Thorpe would have been the one, you know, Thorpe had shown, um, you know, that his back would have been able to stand up to the rigours and 
you know, the, the mental challenges that a five match series against Australia, uh, you know, takes out of you. If it, it, it has showed the indication that could have been possible, you know, I, I wouldn't have batted an eyelid about going with uh, Graham Thorpe. Um, he didn't give us that in indication. There was, you know, yeah, I'll play, but I didn't want any buts. You know, I just wanted a, a team that could play a, a hard game, aggressive game at times, be up in the faces of Australia. Um, you know, I think we, we decided quite quite early in the preparation process of, of, of gambling, really, and going with a, a younger, fresher set of faces, minds um, that Australia really hadn't played against before. So, you know, when we went 1-0 down, I think it was important um, that we didn't have too many um, players in that dress room that had gone through too many bad times against Australia. You know, you'd played a few games, I'd played a few, Trez had, Fred had played a couple. But realistically, we'd not been hammered by them. You know, we'd not had those like long series, uh, whether it was two, 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 three. I had, but I'd had a successful time myself. Um, you know, 99, 98, you go back through the 90s, some of those players, you know, Thorpe and the likes of Darren Goff, Nasser, all these players that were kind of considered in the build-up. Um, great players, great, great guys to have in the dressing room, but I just felt it was worth us having a pop with a, with a, a younger, fresher set of minds. And, you know, to go with Ian Bell, um, you know, the experience that he would have gained from being in that series, he didn't, you know, pull up any any trees, but those 250s that he got at Old Trafford, uh, I would say that probably helped him so much in his in his test career just by being out there, playing in that environment, playing against those legends of the game. Um, you know, and he was a good team member. He was a good guy to have in the team. He would always uh, play it the right way. You know, we, we, we spoke about it all the time, about try and be aggressive, try and be attacking if you can. Because I felt it was the only way to play against that Australian side. And, you know, Ian Bell was was one of those players. As you mentioned, Oli Pope, he, he, well, he's, he is mini Bell, isn't he? Bell is inside him some way. That's exactly the same. Uh, likes to play a few drives too many just at the minute, but that'll come into his equation that you're allowed to defend one or two. And that came into Belly's equation that you have to be able to read the situation and stay in and just, you know, score some ugly runs. It can't always be that you score beautiful runs. It's just not possible. And, you know, I, th I actually think, you know, Ian Bell's a great lesson to Oli Pope. It's a, a real good kind of um, like for like. They play similar and they play in a similar kind of fashion at the stages that they're, they're at. Uh, yeah, the, you know, over time, Belly became a, a brilliant player because he learned how to play the situation exactly the way that Oli Pope needs to try and do. Go to the second morning, Belly, um, Belly gets out early. Fred and Garrett have a little bit of fun and we set Australia 444, you know, a, a good total. First innings runs on the board and you feel as though you can control the game from there. But Australia come out, uh, 50 on for the first wicket and a man who's very close to yourself, um, who got a little bit of stick going into edge Baston, but he really proved what a fantastic champion he was to this four-man seam attack. And that Josh D. Giles, he got a great wicket. I think it was Langer. It was a fantastic catch by Billy at short leg. You know, I think after the first game, he was called a wheelie bit. <laughs> he was. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, I couldn't argue with that. I couldn't argue with that because he did look like a wheelie bin. But uh, we, we, we knew as a team how important the wheelie bin was for us. You know, we knew that, you know, it, over the wicket to the right hand, as he, he played a, a great role for us, for you seamers, to be able to just uh, rotate from from whichever was the, the best end. Uh, you know, you absolutely never got choice of ends, Jarlo. It was always the other end to you guys, whichever end you wanted. It didn't matter about the rough. You were like, no, we're at the you're at the other end. So he got... The wheelie bin could fall into the wind. <laughs> no, wheelie bin struggled. He, he, he got the, the short straw, but... Um, no, we, we 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 were always delighted to to see it. You know, someone contribute, and it's you know it's the nature of you know high level sport that you you've always got individuals in your team that are trying to prove people wrong, and that's pretty much what sports all about. It's about the team, but there's always in, individual battles. Uh, that ball he got Damian Martin with was an absolute cracker. That was a that was a beauty, and that's um, you know that's that that's what that that, that team was about. It was. Uh, a five-match series where, you know, Freddie uh, gets talked about, rightfully so, for what he delivered, but Kevin Peterson on the last day at the Oval. But you kind of go through the whole season, there's always contributions. There was always individuals at the right time that stuck their hand up, and that was the only way that you could play against that Australian side. There's no way you can beat that Aussie team with three or four. Oh. No way. You know, across the whole series, you know, 250s from Ian Bell at Old Trafford, um, Strauss with a couple of centuries, Trez always getting us off to a start. I nipped in at Old Trafford, a bit at Trent Bridge. 
uh, Giron Jones, you know, Trent Bridge, mentioned Old Trafford, uh, Simon Jones, Old Trafford, Trent Bridge, yourself pretty much consistent throughout. Uh, don't know how you managed that consistent throughout, Steve. That was quite remarkable, but well done for that. In six weeks um, of life. <laughs> <laughs> and Hoggy, Hoggy's Hoggy. Hoggy just kept on wrapping the pads of Matthew Hayden early. It was, you know, a, a real team collective, which um, epitomises, you know, you know that one you know, aspect of, of what we were about. But Ashley Jars, he just kept on nipping in. He, he did all right at Eshbass, and that was a big week for him. Yeah. I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been David Houghton had mentioned that England were, we were a 10... 10 man team because Jarlow really well, yeah. didn't, didn't, yeah. offer, didn't, didn't offer us anything. And then at uh, Edge Baston, he delivered a, a few nice wickets, which was great. And uh, the Aussies, you know, they were 71 for three, I think, at, at, uh, at tea. Um, and then end of play, uh, sorry, at lunch. And then Simon Simon came on. Jarlow, he mentioned the ball against Martin. For me, that was the ball of the series. You know, they mm. talked about Gats but, uh, off warning. But for me, Jarlow's was a was an absolute beauty to get rid of uh, Damian Martin. And we had Australia in a bit of trouble at 214 for seven at the end of the day. I mean, at the end of, of day two. And Simon, Simon, that was when Simon really came into his own. He had three for 30. He, he, he ended up with, with six wickets all told. Um, but how was it different dealing with me, Simon, Fred and, and, and Oggy? Because we were similar in one respect. But... There was a little. There was different. There was a little difference where I would imagine, from a leader point of view, you had what to look after them. <laughs> You're all bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Steve, you know me. I'm a bit off, uh, and, and I always used to look in your eyes, and, and I knew you were ready. That that's the most important aspect. Um, you know, I, my belief in, in captains is to make sure you, you guys are all right. You know, I think it's important that your bowler gets as much as as you want. You know, in terms of field sets, um, bowling at the right ends. You know, trying to read the situation of the game. My job was purely to make sure that you 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 were in the right state of mind. So whatever conversations I felt that you guys needed to have, whether it was you about Newcastle United and whatever it may be, uh, I, I would just go with that conversation. Ma Matthew Hoggard, you know, he just makes noises. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't imagine. explain to people under the pressure zone of a, a game, whether it's all traffic, edge past in the oval, walking back to roll his next ball and he's just making animal noises. And, and, and I said, well, what do you, I said, that, that is Matthew Hogg. I mean, what can you say to that? If we don't know, we off. He's making animal noises under the utmost pressure of an Ashes series. He's got like, just ball hoggy. You know, there's not a lot that can be said to someone like him that can help, but Simon Jones... It, it, you know, he's one of the, you know, you look back at uh, Trent Bridge when he, you know, he, he left and he's never played again. You know, he would have got oh, three, four hundred test match wicket. He's just had a gift. He had a gift to be able to bowl that length quickly and swing the ball. <laughs> you know, he was just a natural, uh, skillful, very clever bowler. You know, he always seemed to bowl the right ball at the right time. And that wasn't anyone telling him. That was him instinctively bowling that ball to Michael Clark, that which is off stump out in the second innings. It's a natural gift that he had. Um, I, I think he, 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 the four of you, was probably the most vulnerable. Mm. You know, I think he needed a little bit more care because he, he, he was vulnerable. You know, I think he he, he was the one. That, you know, I think I probably gave a a bit more loving to. You know, I felt that he needed that, which you know that, that's absolutely fine. But. Um, you know, it's pretty easy for me to be honest with the four of you just bowling the way that you were at you know, Freddie hitting length at will at pace, swinging either way. Um, you know, people say oh, captaincy must be quite hard. So it's not that hard when you've got four like that. Mm. It's quite it's quite nice to stand at mid-off and just enjoy it and hopefully put you put you all in a nice state of mind to, to go and deliver a piece of skill. That's uh, that's pretty much what captaincy is about. We actually felt we were footballers mm. for a good ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, it was nice, wasn't it? A bit, a bit of footy in front of a crowd. You wouldn't have seen a crowd at Sheffield Wednesday like that before. No, I'll tell you what, we won't be seeing many next year either. <laughs> <laughs> it did one.